MG Rob back with you. And today we're gonna to be working on my engine, finally. Let's get going. So as some of you know, I actually tore my engine apart before, sometime before I moved to the new shop and found that it wasn't very good. I ended up deciding to start with a new block because I had actually broken the third main cap for the second time. And I decided rather than putting another set of caps in and line boring it again, I would just start with a fresh new engine and do a fresh build. So this is actually a 74 18V block, which actually matches my car. And the head that I have for it is actually a, I think a 73 or 74 as well, which came from a completely different engine than this. But um, we're going to start dry assembling this one. Because what I'm gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna call it dry assembling. We're gonna put it together with the rods and pistons and crank in it, bring them all up to top dead center, measure from the deck to the top of the piston, see wh where they're sitting within the block in relation to the deck height. And then I can make my calculations of how much to skim off the top of the block here and which head gasket I'm going to use to achieve the compression ratio I'm looking for. Because I want to get this engine as close to 10 to 1 as I can get it. I don't want to go over 10 to 1 because I still want to run pump gas. And that's pretty much the limit on pump gas. So I got this engine stand here that I, it's one unlike any I've ever seen before and I've never seen another one like it. This actually came from my father. He bought this sometime in the 60s. It has a cam lock system here that locks it from moving and then you can loosen it up and then it spins not only this way like a normal engine stand does, but you can put it in any position you want. There's no, you know, pins to lock it in any particular position, but it also has a cam lock over here too. So you can take this and you can spin the engine any way you want it to get it in any position you want it. So I like to set them down like this and then you can just drop the cam in and not have to worry about dinging it up as you're putting it in. And if you're having a problem with this thing, maybe not sitting where you want it, like it's um, the center of gravity on it, it's not where you want it, you can actually flip it all the way up like this, loosen these a little bit and then move this around to get it where you want it and then tighten everything back down. So it's really handy. So for the rotating assembly, what I've got is I got this modified late crankshaft that modified, I actually modified this years ago. So it's wedged, take a little bit of rotating mass out of this thing. And then We've got the old max speeding rods. These are becoming very popular anymore as the price has come down on them. And they weigh quite a bit less than the factory rods. Um, I think the rods I had in it before were the late B rods, which were the late, the lightest version of the rods that ever came from the factory. And this whole set weighs something like two pounds less than those. And then we are due to costs and the fact that I don't necessarily need forged pistons. We're using a set of county stock cast pistons, but they're 60 over. And to work with these rods, they have to be the ones with the floating pins using the circlips here rather than the press fit pins. Now I waited on these things for months. They were out of stock. That's why we're just now getting to building this engine. So one of the other things I'm doing is I got myself the Pro Sport damper for it. Because I had, um, with my problems I was having with it, I wanted to make sure we were controlling the harmonics of the engine. Because I don't think my old one, because what we had done was, was trying to take as much weight as we could out. And we took a stock one and actually had taken some weight off of it and rebalanced it. And I don't think that it, um, 
was controlling the harmonics as well as it should have. But these are these are really nice Band balancers. They're spin tested to over 12,000 RPMs, which I hope I never get hit 12,000 RPMs. If I do, it's I won't have an engine anymore. But they are a little heavier because, like the 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 stock balancer, I got a stock balancer here. They weigh in at about three point three pounds, one point six. I'd say probably on average are right around three pounds, two, ounce, two ounces, where this one comes in at three pounds, 14 ounces. So, you know, about 12, about three quarters of a pound more. But um, after driving it, taking as much weight as I had taken out of it, I thought I was at that edge. Of, I had taken enough weight out of the whole rotating assembly that it didn't hurt, didn't hurt to put a little bit back in actually. I got a 15 pound flywheel, the lightweight rods, and all this other stuff. So, now just to show the crankshaft here, we got a stock crank. It weighs in at 34 pounds, you know, 3.2 ounces. Now, this one's been turned 10, 10 on both rods and mains, which will change the weight slightly. And probably there's some variance from the factory anyway. And mine that's been all cut is 32 pounds, 4.4 ounces. So it's roughly two pounds variance. I think I figured I had taken something like 14 pounds total out of my whole rotating assembly when you factored everything in, if I remember correctly. That's just going by memory, so. But I think maybe I went too far last time doing stuff like this. I think will help a lot in controlling harmonics, along with what I did with the oil pan to control oil foaming and oil surge. So hopefully we'll make an engine that'll actually last this time. But fortunately for me, my engine's the only engine ever built that didn't last. Every one of my customers' engines has always done just fine. But like, but this engine was a lot of stuff I've never done before. So with new territory comes problems like this. So we're just trying to correct them. So while I prefer to put all ARP mains and head studs and everything in it, ARP only makes the studs, which is what I've always run in the past in my motors. But in order to run the studs, you have to run the earlier main caps, because you see there's a big difference between them and height. The late main caps are a lot taller. You got a little bit more meat down through there. And since I've done this, to two main caps now. I think I'm gonna go ahead and stick with the heavier mains that come in this motor, which means I gotta go with the bolts. ARP don't make the bolts. So we gotta go with stock type bolts. Now, since this is what we call a dry assembly, so it's not the final assembly, we don't, I'm not gonna worry about cleaning out all of the oil galleys and all that stuff. We just wanna make sure that the surfaces where the bearings are sitting and the bearings and the surface of the crank is clean so that there's no issues there. Uh, now, when we're doing this part, there's a couple ways you can go about it. You could just put a few bearings in here and just worry about getting the deck height. Or like I'm going to do today, is I'm gonna go ahead and check all the bearing clearances all the way across the board just to make sure everything's where I'm actually wanting it to be because this is going back to the machine shop. So if there's any issues that I find, they can be corrected then and I don't have to make another trip. Because uh, while my machine shop is, usually does a really good job and they're always spot on, uh, we have had a miscommunication on my engine before because I wanted to build it slightly more clearance than I would if I was building a, just a street engine for a customer because I am autocrossing it, spinning it a little harder. I was building a little bit more clearance into it, but I didn't want to go like as much clearance as you would with a race engine. 
and he actually took it a little further than I wanted to on the last time. So I'm just going to make sure that it's coming out right. So like I said, the machine shop I use usually nails the clearances. I never have any issues. And I don't actually have a set of inside outside mics. I just use plastic gauge, just like you know, average person at home would use, because I'm not I've, I don't build enough engines to invest into that stuff. And I've never had a problem, so I've been sticking with this this way of doing things. Now you do want to make sure that all this stuff's clean, even though it comes out of the package, you want to make sure you know, use a little solvent, wipe them down, make sure everything's clean before you try to put anything in place. Now, the clearances on the crank is supposed to be between one and a half thousandths and just a little over two and a half thousandths, at 2.7 thousandths. Um, I'm shooting for right around two and a half thousandths as my starting point, because I want to build it to the loose end of the factory because I'm going to spin it a little harder than normal. Now you don't want to, the reason I don't want to go super big on the clearances is because I'm still driving on the street. If it was a full race motor, maybe I'd go more. Uh, but when you go to those big clearances for high revving engines, they tend to not um, do well at idle. They, they beat up the bearings a lot. So we start out, all these things have notches in them here and you want to line up the notches there and that's to keep it from spinning around. It keeps them in place and you're going to start out with the notches right there and get them sitting in there nice and smooth. Go all the way down there, the same those and the caps are the same thing. And we'll go do all that to start with. So for checking the clearances with the plastic gauge, you don't want to oil the surfaces because the oil can change the clearances. So while you're doing this, you don't want to rotate anything. But you basically just break off a piece, lay it down in there and get it running straight. Whoops, got too big of a, a little bit long of a piece there. Lay it across here. Get the knot stick to my finger. To where it's straight across, and then we'll put the cap on torque it properly, it'll smash it down. And then you'll compare it to this gauge that's on the package here. I'll go ahead and torque one down and we'll show you. So once you've torqued the cap down and pulled it back off, make sure nothing's rotating in the process. Then you take this, this, and look at the scale here, and you put this right there and look at how wide that is in comparison. So like that one's actually really close to two thousandths. So it's not actually as wide of a clearance as I was actually looking for. He may have went ahead on this one and just did stock clearance rather than going wider. So now I can still have him polish us slightly and get the clearance I'm looking for. But we'll check all the rest of them, see all the rest of them check. So after checking all five, they were all very consistently right at the two thousands, uh, maybe just like just a fuzz over two thousands. So if I was doing a regular street engine for a customer, just a normal rebuild, I would be perfectly happy with that. For this engine, I'd like to have a little bit more clearance. So I'll end up taking the crankshaft back with me when I take the block back. I'll let them give it a quick little polish to get me where I want to be. And that's why we check it now. Now, my guess would be in this case, he's been very busy all summer long and understaffed all summer long. And my guess is he just basically forgot that I um, wanted this one a little wider and then just went, just nailed the clearances as if it was a customer engine. Because um, you know, he is a smaller shop, slightly disorganized, you know, like me. And I know he wrote it down once before, at one time lost it and wrote it down again. He may have lost that note a second time. But it is what it is. So we go ahead and put this thing back together, clean off all of, all of the um, plastic gauge. 
and I got a couple mains in here lubed up to hold everything in place. We don't have to put all five in there. We just do two or three and they don't have to be torqued to full spec, just tighten down. So now we can put the rods in, check all those clearances, see what those look like. And that's why we want to lubricate the ones we're putting in because we are going to be spinning the crankshaft to do that. We don't want to damage anything. And with each rod and piston assembly, then we can measure where it is to the deck surface and figure that out. So a couple of things to note about these rods is the bushing on the little end needs to be reamed to fit, just like any other aftermarket rod, to get the correct clearances with your wrist pin. So that has to be done before you do the assembly work. Now these things have already been done because actually I had this in the old engine for what little time it was actually running. But the other thing to note is there is no actual oiling hole here like the stock rods did, which according to all of the engine builders who build a whole lot more engines than me, that that is not a problem at all on these engines. So what I'll do now is I will put pistons onto the ends of the rods and we'll go through here and do the same thing that I did with the main bearings is check every single one of these, make sure what my clearances are first, and then we'll take them all, take them out, clean everything up, and then we'll put them back in to check deck height. So once again, it looks like everything's checking about two thousandths. So not exactly what I'm looking for, but really consistent with what I would normally be looking for. So then once we do that, go ahead and get a um, one put in here, bring it up top dead center. Now I'm not worrying about rings or anything because these are not actually finished boards yet. These are just rough board to the correct side and not finished honed yet because we were still waiting on pistons. And when I send this back up, the pistons will go with it He'll measure all the pistons and make sure that we're getting the correct side clearances in each of the holes. So then what we do is we wanna measure from the deck surface down. Now there'll be some slight rocking here. So that's where you, you, it's better to do it like here and here rather than here and here because you might get a false reading. Now, like I've got side calipers here, which these are a really good set, but you could also use dial calipers or dial indicator. This probably is actually get close enough for the for what we're looking for. About 35 thousandths down. About 35 thousandths down. Now what I can do is go get my magnetic uh, dial indicator and check it the same way and see if I get the same reading. Now this isn't necessarily the best, most accurate way to do this, even with one of these, but it's one way to verify that, that dimension. If it's basically showing like if you've got one of these to work with versus if you got one of those to work with, you can get this thing set up right on the very edge of the piston or the block, set it zero and just give it a little bit of a bump to make it hit the piston. See, roughly 35 thousandths. Same measurement we were getting before. So now what I need to do is I need to sit down with my calculator, or my pencil and paper, and do run all the numbers. Do all the calculations to figure out how far down from the deck do I actually want this to get the compression ratio I'm looking for. Now I believe my last engine I had at 15 thousandths down, and that gave me just shy of what I was looking for but I also am now going to look at different head gaskets because I was using the Payan head gasket before and um, Payan, the last head gasket I bought from them was different and I'm not really wanting to use that. I may go with a Kometic gasket. Those can be had in various different thicknesses. So then I need to figure out 
to get my target compression, what would I need to take off here, plus which gasket I would use to get me where I want to be.